All right. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joseph Najem. I'm an assistant professor of mechanical engineering at Penn State. I'm also a theme leader at the Convergence Center for Living Multifunctional Materials and Systems, or LIMC2. So I want to thank you for joining us today. This is our second seminar in the Lim Talk seminar series that we started last month. Um, today, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Olga Speck from the University of uh, Freiburg. Um, she is a principal in, in, uh, investigator in the Cluster of Excellence Live Mats and the Freiburg Center for Interactive Materials and Bioinspired Technologies. Uh, she received a PhD in 2003 in uh, vibration damping from the University of Freiburg as well. Uh, part of her research is focused on functional morphology and biomechanics of plants, um, adaptive materials and self-repairing materials and other um, materials related uh, interests. Uh, today, she will be sharing with us her research on plant-inspired damage control. Uh, so with that, I would um, ask uh, uh, that you give your full attention to Dr. Speck and uh, please leave your questions uh, till the end. Dr. Speck, floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Joseph, for the nice introduction. Thanks also for inviting me to, to give this talk today. And uh, yes, I would like to speak about plant-inspired damage control and inspiration for efficient use of resources and reduction of waste generation. So first a few words about my background. I'm a botanist and I'm associated to the Botanic Garden of the University of Freiburg. And we have in the garden more than 6,500 species. And these are really enough plants uh, to serve as biological models for my research. And that gives me also the possibility to introduce my co-authors. These are Max Langer and Max Mülow. Also, a few words about the class of excellent, uh, excellence. Joseph already said that I'm a principal investigator. And uh, in this LIFMATS cluster, we focus uh, on the energy autonomy of system functions and also on adaptivity in material systems. And then, and here my uh, research comes into play. I'm interested in longevity of system functions, especially of damage control. You will hear more about that later on. And then we have a, a fourth area. This is about societal challenges uh, with respect to these living material systems. And here we look whether there is a sustainability assessment development or some investigations of psychology, philosophy, and ethical implications. And here comes into play the so-called biomimetic promise, and I will tell you later on what that is and what it means. And then we have at least um, a possibility to bring our findings into a proof of concept demonstrators together with our colleagues from the demonstrator area. A short overview of my presentation, I would like to start with biomimetics and sustainability in the Anthropocene because of this is the framework of, of this presentation. And then I would like to introduce four examples, damage prevention by gradual transitions and by response to wind stress and damage management by self-repair and by abscission. And in the end, a few closing remarks. Okay, so let's start with the Anthropocene. Grusen and Sturmer coined the Anthropocene in 2000 as a human-dominated epoch. What does that mean? It has three characteristics. First of all, the accumulation of anthropogenic deposits, for example, radionuclides or microplastic. And second, and that is the so-called ex uh, great acceleration, and you can see that on the right-hand side in this picture, this means an exponential change in human-induced effects on Earth. Everything is increasing exponentially, also waste generation and energy use. And then third, the largely irreversible influence that humans exert on the entire Earth system. And we can say that we are dangerously close to a tipping point of global warming. So scientists, we should answer, 
what, what, what do we need to act now if we wish to preserve any ch chance of counteracting these effects? We should come into action. So another thing, interestingly, the proclamation of this Anthropocene in 2000 occurred simultaneously with the consideration that biomimetic products can contribute to a more sustainable future. So this is a hypothesis. So first of all, we had a look, a made a statistic, and you can see here on the, the number of the publications, which uh, focus on the relationship of, of biomimetics and sustainability, and here the years from 2099 until 2021. And we, really, we can see there is an exponential increase of uh, publications that deal with this topic. But we have to look what means biomimetics. Otherwise, we can't prove this hypothesis. So the background is that during biological evolution, many damage control mechanisms have been evolved and interestingly, also independently of each other. And that is a, a, a really a chance for us because of that is the, the guarantee that we have a bunch of, of uh, biological concept generators to learn for technical applications. A few words, what is biomimetics? It is a systematic transfer of functional principles that we find in biological models and that we then transfer to technical application. And in, in this uh, biomimetics um, system transfer, we have two approaches. And I show you this here in these graphs. We have here first the technology pull process, which starts with a technical question of an engineer who wants to improve uh, technical application uh, by ideas from a bio uh, biological concept generator. And here we have the biology push process. That means a scientist, a botanist, whoever starts with a biological question, for example, about um, self-repair of plants in arid uh, environments and wants to know more about the plant. And then all the other steps are similar. That means after having formulated this, on the, this question, then we start to, um, to study our biological concept generator. We have to select them beforehand. Then we try to understand the functional principle. And uh, as soon as we have understood the underlying principle, now we have to get rid of all the details of the plant. Because if we don't want to put all the details we have learned about the plant and the functional principle or the function into a technical application, we don't want to make a copy. We want to abstract only these variables and these findings that we need for a technical application. And as soon as we have abstracted the, the, the details that we need, then we can translate it into an engineer compatible uh, language, for example, an analytical or a numerical uh, model. And that is the prerequisite for a technical application. And in the case of the technology pool process, we have in the end an improved imp uh, biomimetic product. And if we are lucky in the biology push process, we have a new biomimetic product, product and they are on the market. So this is a stepwise systematic transfer of functional principles. No word about sustainability. Please keep that in mind. Now I come to the biomimetic promise. What does that mean? It's clear. Learning from nature is linked with the hope of learning from biological solutions. That is what I showed you. And that seem to these solutions seem to be evolutionary optimized, ecologically adapted, low risk, and sustainable. So we have the feeling that we can grab some special quality if we have a look into nature. Next question is, is nature sustainable? And I would say no, nature is not sustainable itself in the sense of an anthropocentric or a teleological mission statement or light motive. And therefore, it cannot provide simple blueprints for sustainability. Next question is, are biomimetic solutions sustainable? And you can imagine that I say no, because of the, de the development of a biomimetic innovation does not automatically guarantee its 
capacity. I showed you the approaches. There was no word about sustainability. And so it can't be a simple byproduct of these biomimetic approaches. I would say the better question is, are biomimetic solutions more sustainable? And we say the best thing is if we carry out comparative sustainability assessments and we should compare the biomimetic product with the reference product. Then we can, in the end, we can say which of both is more sustainable. After all these answers of no, I would now like to, to ask, can we learn from nature for sustainability? And here I would say, yes, we can learn from biological concepts for sustainability strategies, such as efficiency, consistency, and sufficiency. I will show later on some examples. And then a few years ago, in the Transregio, we worked together with, um, with engineers uh, from, from the Fraunhofer in, in, Stutt in Stuttgart, and uh, we were talking and, and thinking about a bio-inspired sustainability. And we are sure that nature can provide inspiration for the development of solutions with some special attention on the relationship of social, economic, and environmental functions and the corresponding burdens. So we have a kind of a trade-off between functions and burdens. This sounds a bit like efficiency. And I'll show you later an example where you can understand this approach. How can we act to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all? As I told you, it's not so easy just to produce some biomimetic solutions. We have to do more. And I think a very good step is that we have this 2030 agenda, which is an internationally agreed set of 17 sustainability developmental goals SDGs. You can see them here on the left hand side, such as no poverty, no hunger, or life below water. And, and I will focus on number 12, responsive consumption and production. And in addition to the SDGs, we have 169 targets and 230 SDG indicators. So what does that mean? Here on the right hand side, you see an excerpt of the agenda, and it is our goal 12, and this is here called ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns. So this is a general goal. Now they formulate various targets, for example, here the 12.5, by 2030 substantially reduce waste generation through prevention, reduction, recycling, and reuse. This is much more um, targeted and if we have this target, then we should have the possibility to measure whether we are we are uh, whether we have uh, we are successful with these ideas, and that is how now the indicators come into play. Play in this case, national recycling rate can be measured, or the tons of materials recycled. So these are a, a lot of a lot of pages of these uh, of these agenda with all these uh, SDGs targets and the indicators, and it's internationally agreed, but it sounds a bit more like politician. So what can we do as a public? And I can say um, there is a possibility that, and here also, bio-inspired solutions can help. So in the context of the circular economy, the so-called ARS framework of sustainability offers us, the public, designers and manufacturers, up to nine action instructions so that we can participate in resource conservation and in waste avoidance. And here are these straightforward action instructions, all starting with an R, rethink, refuse, reduce, reuse, repair, repurpose, return, recycle, and recover. And we can say that we have to interpret these uh, action instructions with respect to the pillars of sustainability, whether society, economy, or environment, environment or, and we have to have a look uh, to the sustainability strategies to make things better or different or uh, to change our lifestyle in terms of su sufficiency. 
So now we had all these R words, and now I would like to start with my second part of the presentation. Um, we want to have a look what we can learn from damage control in plants. First of all, there are two paradigm, uh, paradigms. First, the damage prevention, and damage prevention, for example, by the formation of uh, gradient transitions or by the response, for example, to, to wind loads, that enables plants to withstand higher stresses without damage. Having no damage also means for technical applications, no waste generation and resource uh, uh, use is uh, smaller. And the second paradigm is the damage management. And here that is clear on the one hand side, we have the self repair, that means that we mitigate damage, but, and that may be a bit astonishing, also abscission. That means the abscission of, of plant organs and that creates weak points and ends up with a damage. And I will show you that also this may help us, for example, for uh, recycling. Okay, a few years ago, we were working together with the architects in at the University of Stuttgart, and they asked us botanists, how can we connect rod shaped and planar elements because of that is particularly demanding we have these huge changes in geometry in size and shape you can see an example here on the right hand side. And we said, okay, that is not such a problem because of we also know that from nature and it's also well known from technology. So technical connections, as we can see here, are mostly rely on a large number of individual components. And these are often prone to failure because of their occur areas of high stress and high strain. Together with my student, I, I had an idea to focus on foliage leaves. And you can see here one example. And we have here a transition zone that connects this planar lamina with a rod-shaped petiole. And this transition zone is damage resistant to bending and to torsional loads. And it is a smooth structure because of um, the superimposition of various gradients. And now I want to show you first which leaf models we selected and why, and then a few of these gradients uh, that are superimposed. So um, we choose these four leaf models because the first uh, criteria was the body plan. We uh, uh, differ between monocotyledones and decotyledones. That means that these plants have uh, a variety of or several uh, characteristics that are different. For example, and that is what you all know from tulip leaves, for example, that they have a parallel venation, whereas the decotyledones mostly, mostly have this network of venation. And they also differ in other characteristics. And then we had a look and said, OK, it would be great to have the spatial configuration. And here we have a 2D configuration. That means that the petiole emerges at the margin of the lamina. And in the 3D uh, configuration, we, the petiole ends up here, more or less in the center of the lamina. So the 3D leaves also are called peltate leaves or umbrella leaves. And now let's start with the first gradient. Let's have a look on the cross-sectional geometry, how it develops from the petiole to, to the transition zone. And here we see we have this U profile. And if you go a bit further up to the transition zone, we also have this U profile. And here you can see the lamina starts. The same here, we have uh, here an elliptic. Uh, cross section also with an, a very tiny groove and, and the strengthening tissue has a U shape. And we see this structure again here. And you can see to the left and to the right is the lamina. So the 3D uh, uh, configuration here, we often have circular cross sections. There is uh, one exception uh, in Caladium bicolor. It uh, go, starts with a circular um, cross section and then it, it becomes more and more triangular. But we haven't seen any uh, sudden change of geometry. Next thing is the shape. 
the tapering mode, you all know that biological rod shaped um, uh, organs have uh, in, at the base a more uh, a greater diameter than it at the apex. And uh, we can uh, calculate this tapering mode. And you can see here, if, if it is zero, then it's no tapering mode, it's a circular cylinder. If it's one, it's a circular cone, or it can go up to 1.5. And we could calculate the tapering mode for all our leaf models. And we saw that they differ between 0.91 and 1.5, but we didn't saw any sudden change uh, of the diameter. The next gradient is the size, also very important for, for the leaves. And uh, if we plot a size variable, in this case, it is the actual second moment of area, but it also works with the area or the torsional second moment of area as a function of the height. And here it's more basal, the petiole, and here more apical uh, towards the lamina. Then we see that we have two curve segments. First of all, here, the black dots, this is the petiole that hardly increases, sometime or sometimes also decreases linearly. And then it, it smoothly goes into an exponential increase, these are the red dots, and this is the transition zone. And we could find these two curve segments for our four selected leaf models. Now we come to the strengthening tissues. In this case, these are micro CT uh, recordings, and we uh, colored the vascular tissues. Vascular tissues are uh, responsible for the transport of water and sugar, and also responsible for the mechanical stability of the leaves. And we see here the, uh, nicely the parallel venation of hosta leaves. Then we can have a look on the two 3D uh, leaves, and they look pretty similar. And here we have these hemigraphies with this U profiled uh, petiole. It looks a bit weird, but also here we saw some smooth uh, transition of, of all these uh, strengthening tissues. And now I want to zoom in until we are in the microscopic level. And you can see here that we go into the micro, microscopic level and the cellular level, a cross section. And here in red, stained in red, are the lignified strengthening tissues, the vascular tissues I showed you before, which were colored there in blue. And what we can see here is it is very red here in the middle, and then it fades out. This means we have, uh, we have a, a, a of lean concentration. And if you have a look here, we also see that it, it looks very porous. And these two pictures were an inspiration for architects at the University of Stuttgart who developed a, a graded concrete for buildings. And here I want to introduce two things. First of all, the graded concrete, and then also, as I promised, the bio-inspired sustainability assessment visa. OK, so I said we should compare biomimetic solutions with conventional solutions. And that is what we did here. We have here a slab, and that is built of conventional concrete. And here we, we summed up all the, uh, the resources, and we <laughs> hopefully got, got to 100%. Then uh, we compared it with the um, graded concrete uh, slab. And you can see that we already have some savings. And then when we also include the indirect saving effects, and that means if the slab is not so heavy, we don't need so much load bearing structures. So this, the walls can be smaller as also the pillars. Then we have an additional effect and we have uh, additional savings. And um, that is the first thing where we really can see that we have less resource use. And um, now I come to the bio-inspired sustainability assessment, which depends on the ESO assessments, but it has this uh, nice graphic in the end. And what we can see is, and I told you that before, we have here the function that is clear. Every slab has a function in a building, physical uh, functions, and so on. And um, here in, in the lower part, we have the resources that we use to produce these slabs. And the interesting thing is this gray circle here, because of this gray circle, this is um, a normalization to the conventional 
product. That means this is our slab with the conventional concrete. And we can see that the function of the conventional and the biomimetic uh, solution is similar. So both have uh, fulfill all functions they should. That is good. But now if you have a look on the resource use, we see that our graded concrete needs less resources than the conventional one. And in total, I just a few uh, numbers here, but it's all uh, already um, published. You can have a look if you want to. We see that the resource depletion is in total around 56%, global warming per annual 19%, and material and energy cost around 40%. And that is not too bad, I would say. This was the first example, and I want to conclude. Uh, what can we learn from plants? Damage prevention by gradient transitions. First of all, we should have a look if that is a 3D, a 2D or a 3D uh, spatial arrangement. In 2D, we often have elliptic cross-sections with a groove or a real U profile, and uh, the 3D ones mostly have a circle. We sh saw that the shape is a bit different, but without any uh, abrupt changes. Also, the size is comparable. We also saw that the 3D course is uh, smooth and without uh, any uh, changes that, that are very um, sudden. And also the mechanics, and that was this lignification, which uh, has an influence on the mechanics. Also, that is fading out and uh, produces these nice gradients. And by superimposing all these gradients, you have these nice, smooth transition zones. So now I come to the next example, that is the response to uh, wind stresses. And um, <clears throat> that is clear, everybody knows and knows it and sees it every day that plants are exposed to a wide range of bending and torsional loads. For example, wind, rain, can be snow, also animals passing by or birds sitting on a plant. And um, there evolved a kind of trade-off in these leaves and they, because of they should be still enough to bear their load, and they should be flexible enough to twist. You can see that here is, is one um, leaf of Caladium bicolor in a wind still situation, and now we put it into put it into the phyto chamber, and we have a wind of around six meters per second, and you can clearly see that the lamina, the lamina and the petiole started to bend and to twist. This is a kind of reconfiguration or streamlining. And um, during my PhD in 2003, we were in South France to have a look what kind of wind profile uh, the Arundo Donax, the, the giant reed has to withstand. And you can see here the experimental setup uh, in the Camargue. And here is our, here are our uh, measurements uh, and we are at the edge of the, of the, um, of the stand. <clears throat> here is the height above ground and here we have the wind speed and uh, the, the numbers of uh, the curve of the edge of the stand is the red one. And then we took these into the stand and measured again. And then we found a bit of another curve. But what we can say, and that was not a stormy day, we had a wind speed between one and around seven meters per second. Now let's have a look how plants can withstand these wind loads. We calculated the drag force. That means the, the surface of the plant in direction of the wind. and. Uh, it is in this diagram as a function of the wind speed. And we see that in the beginning, uh, if we have uh, small wind speeds, one to one point, uh, zero to 1.5 meter per second, then we have a relationship to the square, to the square here also, to the square of the wind speed. That means the plant doesn't reconfigure it. It, it, it is how, how it is, but with, around 1.5 meters per second, the plants start to bend, to streamline, to twist. Um, and suddenly we have this linear relationship. And now we could calculate what would happen if the plant 
can't streamline, if it can't con reconfigure it, then the screen curve would go, oh God, it would go until the ceiling of my room. Um, and we could calculate this, um, this reduction. And you can see we had one to around seven meters per second. And if we go to, to five or eight meters per second, there's all, there is uh, already a track reduction of 68%. And if you go to 10 meters per second of 73%, uh, 73%. That means that due to the streamlining and reconfiguration, bending and twisting of the entire plant and its, its leaves, the plant can withstand higher wind loads without damage. So these, this reconfiguration, this deformation of plants, that is a very, very interesting and important feature. I have spoken about response. And I really want to show you here what kind of complications can occur if a botanist talks with an engineer. So response seems to be easy to understand. We respond to mechanical stimuli, for example, wind. This is an individual plant and that starts to reconfigure, to streamline, and that can take place within seconds, minutes, or up to days. Then there is a next thing. Uh, that is called acclimation in, in biology. Also individual plants, and they have wind uh, from one side, for example, over weeks or months. And then we see that they, that they change their morphological, their anatomical and mechanical properties of the plant tissues. So this is what we call more tigmo morphogenesis, but in the end, it's nothing else than a trained plant because of a plant at the edge of a stand has uh, more wind load than a plant in the middle of the, of the stand. And now uh, the complication starts with the word application, uh, adaptation, because of in biology, this is only reserved for populations of plants. And that is reserved for evolutionary time periods and also for the change of genetic materials over uh, uh, various and several or many generations of plants. So I was talking about response in my e example. And I want to go on with this response and uh, deformation example uh, that, that, was, um, that was transferred to a technical application by my colleagues. You see here the flectofin which is a hingeless flapping mechanism. It is a facade shading uh, system. And that was inspired by the deformation principle of this bird of paradise. And you can say that had an interesting pollination mechanism. Um, in response to the, that is a response to the mass of the bird, you, which is, uh, should be uh, indicated by this arrow, it starts to bend and to twist and to present the pollination here, the pollen inside. And now the, the bird is sitting on this perch and has all the pollen at, at its um, feet. And then it goes to the next, to the next, to the next flower and brings the pollen from one flower to the other. So um, what we learned is that for this, for this facade shading that we need this backbone and this backbone causes when it is bent and, and a bending, as so the bending of the backbone causes the attached lamina here on both sides of the backbone to deflect sidewards. And you can see that here it is open and now it starts to bend a bit and the, lami uh, the, the both lamina start to deflect sidewards and here the facade shading system is closed. And this, bending of the backbone is nothing else than a lateral torsional buckling. And that is absolutely forbidden for architects because of that is a failure mode. And if you don't have it under control, it may be a disaster. So our colleagues from the architecture were very astonished that nature uses this failure mode for, for such a very important uh, function of pollination. But now they have created and developed this, uh, this flectofin facade shading and without hinges, this shading system is less prone to damage. And that is what we wanted to have material or systems that are um, where damage is prevented. 
So what did we learn now from the damage prevention by reaction to wind stresses? On, by, uh, so first of all, I showed you that we have this response uh, to wind or to to uh, other, uh, or in, in the case of, of the flectofin to, to, the, to the bird uh, mass. And that is what we call reconfiguration or streamlining. But then we also can have after a while the acclimation and that ends up with these strained plants. And I can tell you, we made a, a, a review and <clears throat> everything can happen to these plants. Sometimes uh, the control has a, a, a higher stem length than the wind uh, than the wind group or in the other way or the other way around. Also the mechanical properties can differ in all directions. You never know, you, you have to do these studies and then you know what, how your plant uh, acclimates to, to, the, to the mechanical stimuli. And then I talked about adaptation, and I think here we have learned that we have a, that over evolution, a trade off um, has developed between the pediole and the transition zone because of we learned that the pediole is stiffer in bending than in torsion. And the transition zone here is stiffer in torsion than in bending. And that is absolutely new information. We never heard that before. Okay, so now I come to the damage management and I would like to start with the self-repair and the mitigation of damage. First of all, what is self-repair? We have a lot of other words and uh, from our viewpoint, we can say that in biological and in technical systems, we have two phases. First, after the damage, we have a rapid sealing phase. And that means that there are fissures still present. Um, uh, they are repaired functionally, but not repaired in terms of mechanical properties. And you can see here, there is such a sealing cell squeezing into this fissure. The fissure is already uh, present, but it is functionally repaired. And then after this rapid sealing, uh, the second bit longer uh, uh, term self-healing process starts. And after this, the fissure is no longer present. And we see here such a healed fissure and it is repaired structurally and mostly or partially the mechanical properties are recovered. We did some comparative studies on succulent plants which live in arid uh, environments uh, to find out what kind of self-sealing principles and what kind of self-healing principles we find. And we could find everything on various hierarchical levels. Self-sealing can take place in entire organs. This is a, a, a leaf that deforms, or it can be a deformation of tissues. You see here these hooks, or it can be the sealing cells on a cell level squeezing into the fissure, or what we also found was the release of plant sap here. This is mucilage, but it can also be resin or latex. And the seal healing principles mostly start with the development of a wood periderm, and then we find sometimes the formation of the ligno, ligno superized boundary layer that pretends uh, the, the plants from dehydration, but also from attack by pathogens. Sometimes we find that there are lignification in the wound region to compensate the mechanical weakness. And here you see such a latex prop uh, after coagulation also preventing the plant for uh, further harm. I would like to have a look on the Delosperma cooperi. Um, here we have, a, this is a, a stand in the Botanic Garden of, uh, of Freiburg, and you see there are already some damage, but the plant can, can easily seal and heal it. So there's a high evolutionary pressure on rapid self-repair, of external injuries to protect the plant from dehydration, especially if we have a look on succulent plants, which uh, grow in, in semi-arid or arid uh, environments. So uh, my student brought this plant from the botanic garden, and then we started to make some um, external mechanical injuries. <clears throat> and you can see what happened. So if we made 
a transversal cut and or a longitudinal cut on one side of the of the leaf, then we saw after 60 minutes that it started to bend a bit like this here. Okay, and after 60 minutes, the wound edges met and then it stops. And then we, we tried something else. We made a kind of circumferential or a ring uh, incision. And after 60 minutes, we, we saw that it started not to bend, but to contract and it stopped when the wound edges met. Now we wanted to understand well, how, how, how does that work? We wanted to understand the functional principles. We're talking about functional principles in, uh, in, with respect to the, to the biomimetic approaches. Multicellular plants, um, the deformation of multicellular plants depends on the tissue size and it depends on the time scale. Now let's have a look uh, our plant, uh, our, our leaf has a diameter of three millimeters. This is here. And we said it after uh, 60 minutes, it stopped. So we end up here. And that means that this is more or less driven by hydraulic movements. And I think that is clear. We have a lot of water inside and we then uh, carried out with colleagues a numerical model based on the theory of porous flow and pore elasticity. And what we found out was, first of all, directly after the damage, there's loss of water through the wound and that initiates this self-sealing. And then it depends, uh, this, this deformation depends on the permeability of the cell. Uh, cell membrane and of the tissue, and these are the determining variables or parameters. Uh, but sometimes these hydraulic movements can be speeded up by instabilities, and they are here in this uh, graphic. And we then started to, to develop an analytical model to, together with Wilfried Konrad based on elastic and viscoelastic deformation. And the, the idea was uh, as such. We have five shells. Here you see a very young leaf, and we have here five shells, and uh, we have an epidermis, a net of vascular bundles, then chloranchyma, parenchyma, and in the middle, again, uh, vascular tissues. And now this young leaf starts to collect water, 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 and you see it, it uh, becomes succulent, and these tiny cells here are full of water under pressure, and so the the parenchyma or the parenchymitis uh, tissues are under pre-compression. And these are like spirals now under the vascular tissues are now under pre-tension. That means these intact leaves here, they store elastic energy. And now as soon as a, a cut occurs, it releases this uh, stored elastic energy until a new mechanical e equilibrium has installed or established. And now we understand why we have this bending when we have a transversal or a longitudinal cut, because of this is a symmetric structure. And if we uh, destroy the symmetry on one side, then we have the bending situation. And if we make a ring incision, then we have, uh, um, we make a, um, a cut around this uh, symmetric, uh, the cut is symmetric. And that means that we have a contraction of the entire structure. And I gave, uh, so what, what we now see is that we have both, we have the hydraulic movement and we have the mechanical instabilities. And I think since self-repair is a fundamental function for these plants, it can be assumed that it is secured by redundant mechanisms. And redundancy is one of the longevity concepts we found. And so, in fact, our results indicate that the two underlying principles complement and support each other. So the question is now, if we want to produce a self-healing material, do we need both principles? I can say, no, you don't need it because of that is free to you. A few years ago, I gave a presentation on the stelosperma uh, self-sealing uh, mechanism that was a bit longer and more details. And uh, Marek Urban was sitting in the audience and I could see that he starts thinking, thinking, thinking. And a year later, he wrote me, so now I have developed a self-healing material with shape memory effect. And you can see that um, here is the damage. And after 60 minutes, 
it looks pretty good. And after 120 minutes, already two uh, properties, the tensile strain and the stress at break are over 80% restored. So that is really possible to develop self-healing uh, and self-healing materials based on biological models. Also here, I want to conclude. Uh, we see that we have three possibilities for, for the mechanisms, the physical ones, and that was what we uh, found in self-sealing principles. These are the, the cell uh, saps under overpressure like latex or resin, or the turgor of the sealing cells that squeeze into the fissures, or this should, um, should show the, the pretensions of, of the tissues. Um, that we that we found in Delosperma, for example. Then we have chemical reactions. That is, for example, the latex coagulation, but this is already self healing. And we have some metabolic um, processes, for example, the formation of this lignosuperized boundary layer or the formation of new cells in in the in the wound area. We know that especially these processes are very, very difficult to transfer to technical applications. That is the reason why mostly the self-sealing effects are at the moment uh, transferred to technical applications. And now I come to the last um, example. This is the abscission and we made a comparative a study of two cacti. We have the Opuntia ficus indica with very stable connection of the material systems at the branch branch uh, connections. Also, we have here these superimposed gradients, and you see here some uh, MRI pictures. You can see there is a branch, and here's a huge branch, and there is a very narrow connection, but it is strengthened by additional periderm. And here we have the cylindropuncia bigelovi, and it is, it's well known for the, for the abscission zones, and that it is um, that, that the, the branches really fall off if there's only some wind. So, but that is interesting for us because of this, in this integration of the material system is controlled spatially and temporarily. And um, here we have the Christmas flower, a longitudinal section. We have the stems. Here we have the petiole of, of the leaf. And here we have the abscission zone. And what you can see is that this is not only one material. In this schematic drawing, you can see these are a variety of materials that have to be disintegrated. We have the epidermis with the cuticle. We have the parenchyma, the phloem, the xylem, and so on and so on. And this abscission zone has to be exactly here because of there is a bud for the leaf of the next year. Um, you know that leaf fall, for example, it starts mostly with the degradation of the chlorophyll. That is the, the reason why the autumn leaves appear yellow or orange. That is not so interesting for, for our application. But then, and that was really very interesting to me, then these plants start to, to form uh, to, with a protective layer formation. And this is an impregnation of the uh, parenchyma cells with superin and lignin. And if you remember, I showed you that we find these superin lignin boundary layers also after a damage. So it seems that this plant knows, knows that there will be a damage in the next few days or what, and it already prepares itself by the impregnation of these parenchyma cells to protect the plant uh, from pathogens. So how does this detachment can take place that can be a an, an sudden change of, of size, shape, or cell wall thickness, or also mechanics? It can be that uh, there are some cells that start to collect water and swell, and then they burst, and that makes the organ fall off. Or sometimes we also know that there are some enzymes um, involved, and they self-digest the middle lamella, and then the leaves, uh, the cells fall apart. 
So what we learned from these abscission uh, zones is that we need these sudden changes as a prerequisite for the intended detachment zones, and then they ensure the disintegration of material systems. And that is important for us for technical solutions of efficient recycling. If you have a look on, on this cross section here and we look this region of interest at this region of interest and we go from left to side to, to the to the right, then you see that the cell size um, the cell size differs and sometimes we have a sudden change. Uh, uh, as in this case, or if we have a look on the cell walls, we have a sudden change, but now in, in this region, we all we have a gradient change and so on. That means if we could sum up all these variables, cell size, thickness of cell wall, uh, liquidification and further parameters, then if we have a stable connection, we should end up with such a continuous line. Then we have a gradient uh, and the transition zone. And if we have, if we sum up everything, if we have such a peak, then that is a predetermined breaking point. And that is what we call in the end an abscission zone. So also here, uh, a, a short summary, we saw that we have um, that uh, for abscission, the shape plays a role because if we have these, these narrow uh, connections of two branches, we also saw that uh, the geometry can differ, also size and shape of the, of the cells sometimes have sudden changes, enzymes or swelling can play a role, and also sudden changes of, of mechanical properties. They are prerequisites for these abscission zones. Now, again, and the marks. Um, I started with the Anthropocene. It was really a, a long story, but I want to, to put everything on, on this uh, slide. So the proclamation of the Anthropocene occurred simultaneously with the considerations that biomimetic products ought to contribute to a more sustainable future. That was in the year 2000. And uh, we were talking about the biomimetic promise, which is just a wishful thinking. The engineer has a specific ethos and a respective approach to nature and complement the technical ambition of the practice. So this means sustainability has to be a target of the development of also of a biomimetic product. I told you that nature's closed material cycles serve as models in the search for sustainable solutions. That is what, what we call circular economy in uh, contrast to linear economy. And now perhaps in the end, uh, a misunderstanding because of, I often see here or read, nature does not produce any waste. And that is not true because of nature has also produced and deposited waste. And it, this is in the form of the brown coal, the black coal, peat, natural gas, oil, and so on. And the problem is that we dig it out and we burn it. And now we have a CO2 problem. So um, it's not so easy. Um, the next point I want to make is that we have some straightforward instructions, practical guidance to fulfill the sustainability developmental goals, uh, because if we have these R's framework with all these R words, and uh, to this uh, R framework, also the plant-inspired damage control uh, mechanisms can contribute. A word to damage prevention, I think we know that this is technical standard already now. Even in the case of misuse, most products do not break down. If you imagine you drive with your car with 100 kilometers per hour over the pavement, normally your tires don't break. This is uh, already, damage prevention is already inclu included. But damage management is rarely found in the form of products with a self-repair function or what, we show, what I showed in the end with a plant determined, predetermined breaking point for fragment the product for reuse and to disintegrate its materials for recycling. I think here we could become better. And the last word about the relationship of um, 
can't believe it. My, my mobile phone. Um, and last word, the politicians should translate our findings, our scientific findings from research and development projects into recommendations for action and for legislation. Because of we can give the politicians all the knowledge we have, but in the end, we know that if there are no recommendations for action and for legislation, we will not succeed. And that brings me now to the end. I want to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer your questions. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Speck. This is a very interesting talk. It's amazing how much we can learn from the plants uh, to design materials.